But I don't think that today is just another Sunday. In fact, I don't think any day is just another day. I just, I just feel like this day, whatever day of the week that is, this is the day that the Lord hath made. And I'm going to rejoice in it. I'm going to try to grow today. You want to try to grow today? You going to try to learn something? Jeremiah is complaining to the Lord. How many, we, we there are some complaints that we could desperately give to God. I mean, Jonah had them. Judas had them. The, I mean, the greatest though, Paul had them. Peter had them. Jeremiah had them. And the Lord slightly rebuked him and said this, if racing against mere men makes you tired, how are you going to race against horses? The Lord has caused you I'm sorry, has called you to not fight against mere men. Don't get entangled in the trivial matters of human to human conflict. But do you know there are spirits of this age that want to destroy you and your family? And so when you step out of the way, because either we're ignorant of the war that is waged against us or whether we don't want any part of it or whether we just don't have the capabilities to know how to stand the enemy gains ground on our territory I just want to drop some seeds in you that the enemy wants your territory he wants your home he wants your family and he will use well-meaning men and women to do it. Come on. He will give you people in your life to offend you, to rub you the wrong way, to cause you to lose sight of the real battle. Oh God, they did me wrong. I know, I know they did you wrong. They did me wrong too. And guess what? You did some people wrong too. Don't look at me funny. You know you did some people wrong. God, I'm complaining. Here I am. I'm complaining again. God, I'm tired. I'm, I'm tired of fighting against men. I'm tired of fighting against, against flesh and blood, my own, my own stuff. I'm tired of fighting myself. How many is tired of fighting yourself? How many is tired of the inner conflict? Come on. Dude, you know what Jesus is saying? He's saying, look, if wrestling with yourself and with your neighbor gets you tired, how are you going to run against horses? The things that are really trying to destroy your life. I told you before, I say it again. The enemy wants to remain anonymous in your life. Everybody say anonymous. The enemy doesn't want to give up his identity in your life. The enemy doesn't want to give up a foothold in your life. The enemy doesn't want to give up territory in your life. You know the scripture in Ephesians chapter 6 that says neither give place to the devil. Place comes from the word topos which means topography. It is literally territory. Don't give your territory up to the no devil you can't have my kids. No devil you can't have my mind. No devil you can't have my mama. No devil you can't have my grandparents. No devil you can't have my business. No devil you can't have my marriage. No devil you can't have my home. Could I have a look? I don't know if my notes are somewhere back there. Just stay with me. Do I not have notes? All right, go to Philippians chapter 3, real quick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Help me out. Right here. Man. Didn't she do a good job? Thank you. Thank you. 
I just want to, I just want to bring something to you. I'm going to give you just a couple practical tools. I'm going to read four verses in Philippians 3. I'm going to start in verse 12, but the entire chapter is gold. Without reading the 11 verses preceding it, I'm just going to give you the cliff notes, okay? So we can, it'll help us usher in those four verses. It'll give context. Starting in verse 1, this is what Paul begins to sum up. He says, whatever happens, rejoice. This safeguards your faith. I want that to soak in. Whatever, he said, happens. Then he said this, put no confidence in human effort. Then tagging on to that, he said, don't be deceived in thinking that righteousness comes from your strict obedience to the law. Let me put it in layman's terms. There is nothing that your flesh can do to earn righteousness with God. It is by grace through faith that you are saved and not of yourselves. Lest any man boast. Then Paul said something like this. In my words, I said this, when you let Jesus invade your heart, the things you used to see as valuable, you now consider them worthless. I have discarded everything else for his sake. Man, he said everything. He, he, he didn't say 80%. He, and I'm preaching to myself. He didn't say 90%. He said everything. He said 100%. He said everything I have discarded for his sake. In other words, I have suffered the loss of things willingly. Anything I've lost, hear me, for you who have gone through some turmoil and strife and loss, anything you've lost, it's okay. Look to your neighbor and say, it's okay. Because compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ, I count it as dung. That's what he said. In other words, he counted it as waste. He couldn't think of anything else more wasteful and more meaningless than poop. All for one purpose. That I could gain Christ. Now, let's stop right here before we go on. There are some losses you take in life that are prerequisites for spiritual gains. Let's be honest. You didn't pray like that until you got hit with a defeat. You didn't understand the value of paying your tithes until you went through a little bit of financial famine. It was easy maybe to stay lazy on a Sunday and not come to Sunday worship until you found out there was some infidelities going on in your marriage. Oh, then you come in the church. We, we, we may not have felt like touching the throne of God until I felt a lump under my skin and I became worried. Let's be honest, we've all taken some hits. We've all taken some losses. I'm okay with real pain because it teaches me real gain. I'll suffer loss in one column if it means I get to know Jesus better in this column. You ain't with me yet. I'll suffer a defeat over here in this column If it means I get to know Jesus a little bit better in this column. Because what Paul is saying, he's saying there are two columns. He's saying there's a temporal life column. And and then there's an eternal column. And this, in the temporal column, I count it as dung, as waste. Because over here in this column is everything. It's invaluable. It's the infinite value of knowing Jesus. For 
one purpose. That I could gain Christ. Monroe, could you give me a little water, please? Now, you ready for verse 12? Now we're going to read scripture. Now this will have a little more weight. Not that I've already attained it, okay? Not that I'm already perfected. But I press on. Will you open it for me? That I may lay hold of that. Thank you, sir. I'll take the lid too. But I press on. Everybody say press on. on. That I may lay hold of that. Listen to this. For which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. In other words, that means Jesus has had a hold of you before you ever got a hold of him. All the losses you incurred, it was while he was holding on to you. Don't think he wasn't holding on to you just because you had a little suffering in your life. Just because you're going through some defeats and some adversity, don't think Jesus doesn't have a hold of you. But he lets storms come. He lets spiritual things in your life cause you to tremble so you can get hold of him. Man, I never will forget at 17 years old, I flipped my truck at 90 miles an hour. I walked out of it. Truck was laying on its side. It was on fire. I got out. No harm done. My grandpa looks at me and he said, son, that's the mercy of God. I was worried about my truck, 17 years old. My papa was worried about my life. He said, that happened. That's the mercy of God trying to reach for you. There are things in your life. See, we rebuke the storms of life. Little do we know that God has called the storm into existence to cause you to turn and face some things and hold on to Jesus through those storms. You don't learn to hold on to Jesus while the sun is up. And the birds are chirping and the dog's wagging his tail. I need somebody that gets to know Jesus when everything is against you. When you've lost someone important to you. When you've gone through sickness and disease. When you've gone through hurts and you've gone through struggles. Verse 14. Verse 13. Sorry. And then he says this, I do not count myself to have apprehended it now, but there's one thing I do. I forget about those things which are behind and I reach forward to those things which are ahead. I press on, everybody say press on, to reach the end of the race. You're in a race, you're in a race. The world wants you to forget about that you're in a race. Instagram got its own race. You ain't in that race. Entrepreneurs making money ain't that race. Paper chasing ain't that race. It's about purpose chasing. It's about going after the calling of God. That's the race. And I'm pressing ahead. I'm reaching for that which is in front of me. I haven't apprehended it yet, Paul said. But one thing, he said, in order to press forward, I got to let go. Could you give me a chair? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'll never press ahead comfortable in this seat. So sometimes God will stir my nest to get me uncomfortable. And you think it's the enemy. But Jesus, in his mercy, says, I'm going to recalibrate some things in your life. Since you didn't value them, I'm going to take them. Because the things you've been going after, they're temporal. 
They're in the temporal column. They're not eternal. Folks, we're in two different races. We're successful at the race of life. Man, we got that thing figured out. But there's a race that men won't tell you about. But horses will remind you about. You don't race against men. You're racing against horses. And if you can't race against men, you'll never be able to race against horses. And if you think, now say this with love and grace, I love that you're here. There should be wall to wall people here. I'm so grateful that you're here. But if we think that a Sunday morning church service is going to help us, the only thing is we rely on to run this race with horses, the devil is a lie. I cannot go for the thing that is ahead until I depart from the thing that is behind me. Marriages, I'm going to speak to some marriages right now. You say you've forgiven them. You said you've forgiven her. Now, Pastor Rex Johnson said, at this point, he said, do not take a bathroom break. This actually might be a good time for some of us to take a bathroom break right now because you don't want this. But when you bring up the things that you have already forgiven someone of, you are not forgetting the past. You are grave digging old bones in the cemetery of what will be in your life if you don't let things go and press ahead because you cannot hold on to progress and hold on to that which is behind you at the same time let me make this make sense for you because he goes on to say let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. Let go of the past. Hold on to the progress. When I say let go of the past... There are voices in your head that are whispering, give up. That's not what I said. I did not say give up on your relationship. I did not say give up on Jesus. I did not say give up on the thing that you know you're supposed to have. I said let go of the past that hinders what God says you're supposed to have because you cannot hold on to progress and the past at the same time can't do it if you want to get in a posture of press press on press forward then you cannot be holding on to something in your past you press forward while holding on to the progress you have made. Let me encourage somebody in this house. I thank God, and you should too, that you have grown in the last two, three years, or six months, or however long I've seen you. You have grown. Hold on to that progress. Don't lose it. Don't let go. Hold on to the progress. Let go of the past. There's a term that you may be familiar with called loss aversion. Has anyone ever heard of that? Loss aversion? Loss aversion is a cognitive bias that describes why for individuals the pain of losing is psychologically twice as powerful as the pleasure of gaining. For example... 
when you have lost a little money or something valuable, that feeling that is associated with that loss can feel worse than gaining something of equivalent value. For instance, a couple years ago, I was at Dishfalk Field in Austin watching a UT baseball game with my family. I took all three of my children because I can handle them. I'm a man, Johnny. I don't need a woman's help to take care of all three of my kids in a crowd. So I take all three of them. We leave our seats. It's the sixth or seventh inning. I've made friends with everyone in our section. They love us. They love the kids. I take the kids. We kind of walk around the stadium. We do a few things. I got a $20 bill in my pocket. I go to the concession stand. I stick my hand in my pocket. Ain't no $20. I know I grabbed it. It was in there. I start looking because I got this loss of aversion in me. I hate losing something. I will spend half of the day finding it. I lost $20, not the end of the world, but to me, it, it, it kind of took over a little bit and I started backtracking and I'm walking around and I'm looking, Dad, oh, I lost my $20. I'm looking, I'm looking, I get a phone call. It's Rhonda in her seat. And she says, um, where's Gentry? Uh, is she with you? Because she ain't here. In my search for my $20, I had lost the thing that was most important to me. I let her wander off in about 20 to 25,000 people. And she grabbed hands with a total stranger who led her to a security officer who then led her into the stadium and all the way on the third base side while we were on the first base side, my little girl and a security officer (laughs) holding hands. And my mother-in-law spots her and says, Rhonda, Isn't that Gentry? Oh my God! Boom! First person she calls. She doesn't call Jesus and say, Thank you, Lord, for letting me find my. No, she calls husband. Where did you put my daughter? And see, some of us, we are so concerned about losing something. Of no real value. That we end up losing. The thing that is most important to us. Do you get what I'm saying? Oh my heart is heavy. Because right now. I know we think the world has gone to hell in a handbasket now. But you just wait. If we can't run with horses now, you ain't going to run with horses whenever all hell breaks loose. Some of y'all are dealing with hell right now. And we're not prepared for it. And I've been preaching. Get prepared. Please find the place of prayer every morning. Please open your Bible. What does it say? Please don't trust me. Please. Please. I've done too many funerals. I've prayed for too many sick. I've seen too many marriages broken. Dude, I've seen too many kids just go off. Man, could we stand in the house? About a year ago, March 23rd, the Lord spoke clearly into my spirit. And it, this isn't something typical that happens to me. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm pulling up something that happened last year. 
uh, the Lord will give me a short word here and there, and maybe he'll speak to me in a dream or something or something in prayer. I'll feel strongly about in my mind. But this, this time he gave me a direct word and I gave it to the church at that time. I also gave it to faith Academy when I was there for a three day retreat. And here's what the Lord said, March 23rd. He said, the Lord, I said, the Lord spoke clearly on this day. And then, and then here's what he said. The wheat is being readied to separate from the chaff. And the process by which this happens is a shaking. The way that the wheat is separated from the chaff is that it's a win stage, wind, W-I-N-D, a wind stage. You take your winnowing fork, winnowing, a wind stage, and you throw it up in the air, and the wind comes and blows, and it takes the wheat, which is a heavier weighted substance, and blows the chaff away. The Lord wants separation. There's there's a point in your life where he calls you to him and you feel like so light and so burden free. And this, man, I have found the one thing. But it, God is a good father and he doesn't stop there. And he says, I want more. And so he doesn't expect you to stay in that stage that we're in diapers with a milk cloth and a little passy. He says, there's going to be some shaking in your life to cause you to separate from things that have yoked onto you so that you really can come under my yoke in a more exclusive way. Everybody say exclusive. Exclusive. Jesus wants an exclusive relationship. He says, come under my yoke. He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Meaning, the yoke that goes around the neck portion of the ox, it's easy. It actually is pretty comfortable, okay? It's much more comfortable up under his yoke than up under the yoke of the world, the the word it may fit, uh, mm. the world entices you with their yoke and at first it fits real good come here i'm not getting violent i'm not getting violent <laughs> this yoke oh it feels real good i'm not squeezing but the world's yoke puts a tighter grasp around you until you you start to asphyxiate and the littlest things start start to cause sleep deprivation and the littlest things start to cause you to worry and the littlest things start to cause you to act up on your children and start causing you to yell at your husband your husband hadn't done nothing i'm just joking we all have but but then his yoke is easy and the what and the what, what is attached, the burden, his burden is light. Dude, so whatever I got to do in the kingdom, I'm pulling because I'm yoked up to the king of kings, bro. I'm under that yoke so I can pull my family with me. Men, where you at? Men, you better get up under that yoke. You better start pulling your kids. See, you've been pulling your kids without being under the right yoke. You've been pulling your wife without being under the right yoke. Single ladies and gentlemen, you've been single and you've been, or maybe you've been thinking single and you've been married. You've been under the wrong yoke. And that type of burden is hard to carry. But Jesus says, come to me, that labor, you're going to find rest. Because my yoke is easy. And what I have called you to carry is easy. I have called you to carry something that's easy. I have called you to carry something that's easy. My goodness. I need. Danny, are you good letting that thing come up here? Matthew, come up here. I got to share this testimony. 
Y'all come up here. God just reminded me of something. This is Matthew. Matthew is an amazing young man. I'm just starting to get to know him. He's been coming to Bright City for a little bit. Y'all know Danny. Danny's like an OG. Danny's a man. I don't know who wants to kind of introduce what happened. You go. You seem shy, but go ahead. Where you came from. Yeah, okay, so my name's Matthew, as I already told you, but um, I used to be uh, a Latter-day Saint, and uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, I was Mormon, and so uh, around last year, I gave my life to Christ, so praise the Lord on that, but uh, but yeah, uh, it was just a normal Tuesday, I thought, but uh, actually the Monday before, I was a little sick-ish, so I was like, man, Danny, I don't know if I want to go to work, man. And so uh, we went, I was like, you know what, let's just go. And so we go, we're in the truck, we get supplies so we can go work on this shed. And, uh, not, is this good? Uh, but yeah, we start talking about uh, uh, speaking in tongues because I like never had spoken tongues before. And uh, it was brought up because he was talking about someone like speaking in tongues over someone's house because something bad happened there. And uh, I was just like, yeah, man, I've never really, heard, I've heard it once and that was whenever... Jared was actually uh, speaking in tongues over my, my friend Robert back there, and that was pretty cool. But, um, <laughs> yeah. And anyway, he's like, Danny was like, hey, man, you want to you wanna speak in tongues right now? And I was like, you know what? Yeah, sure. And so he, he puts on this YouTube video, and uh, it's this guy, I, f- I forgot what his name was. But um, anyway, he talks about the differences of speaking in tongues and then praying in tongues. But anyway, I wind up, uh, we wind up, uh, he, there's a prayer, and I start, uh, he leads me through the prayer, and uh, I, before I even started really praying the prayer, I felt like, felt the spirit of, like, conviction, and my eyes were starting to tear up a little bit, and I was like, why, why is, why is this happening? But uh, anyway, keep saying the prayer, and then afterward, I start to breathe real heavy, just like my friend Robert was kind of having tear up about, like, two months ago or whatever, and uh as I was breathing real heavy, I felt like a burning in my chest. And then finally I closed my eyes like really, really hard. And then I just opened my mouth and it was just uncontrollable. And my tongue started rolling like crazy and it, it, was, it was just nuts. But, um, yeah, but after though I opened my eyes and my hind end was lifted off the seat, I was like, what just happened? And it, it was pretty crazy. But, uh, yeah, ever since then, my prayer life's been doing pretty good. And I've been speaking in tongues and praying in tongues. Like in the shower, I'm pretty sure last night, I don't really know if I was or not, but in a dream, it felt like I was speaking in tongues. But <laughs> anyway, but yeah, it was pretty cool. I'll let Danny share his cool side of the story. It was, a, <laughs> it was a full-on baptism of the Holy Spirit in my truck on the way to work. Amen. Not even, you know, we, we had not, didn't plan it. We were just heading to work, and, and it was really awesome. Built my faith to, to see it and, and where, where he you know, the church he came from, and just amazing to see God move in just a couple people, you know? So, awesome. Y'all, y'all stay up here for a second. And in fact, and in fact if y'all just want to go on the floor, if anybody else start praying with them. The reason I had them share that uh, is because I wanted to let us know that pressing ahead doesn't happen just on a Sunday. It happened on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, Tuesday. It happens any day of the week when you say, I'm pressing forward. And and let me make a distinction. We're not seeking the tongues. We're seeking the spirit, the spirit baptism that regenerates our spirit. And that's what happened when he was baptized in the spirit. Yes. And it can happen in a vehicle. It can happen on a donkey. It can happen on the first row or the back row. It can happen when you believe it shall happen. God says, look, John has been baptizing with water, but 
I'm coming to baptize you with Holy Ghost and fire. Gary, come up here for a second. Ask Gary. Me and Gary been hanging out lately, early in the morning, in the in the little prayer lounge, and I, I text I text Gary this morning. I said, "Cause hold on to the progress was very strong in my mind this morning," and I said, "Hey man, you got one of those sobriety coins?" And he was like, "Yes, I do." How 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 long is this one? Well, Don't give us all the detail. A it's a year. Okay, it's a year. I thought you were going to talk about all your relapses. Yeah. Don't worry about that. Okay. Here's, and this kind of leads me to my point, is that here, you get this after one year, man, completely sober for one year, three, six, five, all right, 24, seven, boom, sober for a year, right? What happens when you mess up and you go smoke that joint? Or you go get a little intoxicated in whatever way you like, or you go, you know, fulfill that, that lust or that, that impulse. Mm -hmm. You've been doing good for a year. Woo, I've been doing good for a year. And then I'm telling you, you're, it's, it's like you've been on a great diet for a year, and then you're like, dude, that little Debbie snack. <sighs> I deserve that thing. Guess what? When you partake, the enemy's like, look, the enemy's like this. Look, hey, you've been doing so good. He will congratulate you on your sobriety. He will tell you what you need to hear. He will fluff you. He will pander to you. He, in that moment, Satan, who has no love anywhere inside, he loves you at that moment. He, he, it's false, but he's like, you know, just shower and everything. And so you get to that place and you indulge. And guess what? Our mind, it's loss aversion. Where now everything we've done, every progress, everything we've ever done in the last year to get to this point, we feel like it's all lost. It ain't. But that's the lie of the enemy. You've still got a I, there are I don't know who in here needs to hear this but yes you made some bad choices but also true it's not the end of it thank you Gary stay up here Gary come up here come up yeah anybody who needs to come and pray right now to hold on to a little bit of progress. The worship team's gonna, they're gonna sing and I'm gonna step out of the way. And you step right here. And, and look, we're, we're not, we're not gonna rub any juju on you. I, I'm not gonna come lay hands on you. I'm not, I'm, we're, I'm not even probably gonna speak in tongues. All right. Thanks for calling me out and making me feel weird in front of everybody. <laughs> I ain't gonna do none of that. But here's your invitation. If you want to press forward, then you got to depart from your seat. It's something you do in the flesh that begins to open doors in the spirit. It's something that you do when you press from the temporal column. Guess where you're going? You're going to the eternal column. Yes, I may have suffered some loss over here, but man, if it brings me a victory over here in the eternal, then my God, you are merciful. Come on, everybody. Sing to us, worship team. Hallelujah, Jesus. Lord, we just look to you, Father, right? Now. Hallelujah. Come on, I know you want to come. It's all right. It's all right. Come while you got a chance. Hallelujah. Bring your family with you. Hallelujah. Bring your... There's an element of loss aversion that I did not describe. And it's in all of us. We are programmed. That's a part of our brain to protect us from loss. That's why you all have insurance in this place. To help you avoid the feeling or to mitigate the risk 
of loss. Advertisers are engaged in working on your loss aversion when they say a seven day free trial because when you sign up there is no loss assuming that at the end of the trial period you're not going to get rid of it because that means you would scale back what you have you don't want to lose that either and so in this world we have a hard time with leaving that which is behind us because we interpret it as scaling back or loss and when we compare it to something we're going forward with or to we have a hard time with that comparison because Jesus has asked us to operate in faith so we don't quite know what we're going to he just says press forward but let go of the past. I like to know what I'm going toward before I let go of something else. You do too. Loss aversion. I want to mitigate the risk of loss. So I don't know how much money I pay toward insurance. I have a life policy and a home policy and an automobile policy and every policy, whatever you could think. Because I don't want to lose what I have. Walking in faith, you got to be willing to leave that behind. And when you begin to press forward, God says, man, you had faith enough to release it guess what when you released it look at your hand i want you to release something Uh, uh uh-huh okay you're holding it you're holding it now release it okay now look at your hand look at your hand guess what this is the posture of receiving something too so god says i can't give you what i want for you when you're close fisting something let it go and receive man it ain't too late I know some of y'all feel like it's too late some of y'all are excited about tomorrow some of y'all are just regretting about yesterday listen I don't know I don't know if anybody knows that scripture in Joel 2 but it says I will restore the years that the palmer worm and the canker worm and the locust hath devoured I will restore the year if you just follow me everything that you lost back there because Satan really is your enemy and he took a little territory everything you lost God says man if you come to me if you leave that behind and you come toward me I'll restore everything you lost because he's a good dad he's a good dad He's a good dad. Anybody, maybe one person, doesn't have to be, but anybody that want to say anything that's on your heart before we get out of here. Anybody up here? Huh? You want to sing? Y'all want him to sing y'all out? Okay. Guys, we love you. Thank you so much for being a part of Bright City today. We will be at... Faith Academy next Sunday. Okay, so I will see you there next Sunday.